So depending on where you're tuning in, it's either good morning, good evening, or even good afternoon. Uh, so welcome to a joint program, special joint program between the Center for International Law at NUS in Singapore and the Institute for uh, Asia, uh, that, uh, that is Asia Legal uh, Issues here at NYU. So this program, uh, and I will tee it up uh, shortly, is on the global health regime and its reforms of you from Asia. But as, our, as is our tradition, what I usually do as faculty director, Jose Alvarez uh, of the US Asia Institute. So today we're uh, quite excited to look at uh, the reforms being contemplated uh, for the global health regime. Uh, many of you know, this is a very hot topic given COVID just a few days ago, the director general of the WHO uh, following up on a proposal by 25 heads of state for a new pandemic treaty uh, detailed at least his vision of what that treaty might look like. He said it would systematically uh, tackle the gaps exposed by a COVID. The treaty would strengthen, quote, the implementation of the international health regs and critically will provide a framework for international cooperation and solidarity. And he identified the key issues would it are to build resistance, uh, resilience to pandemics and other global health emergencies with robust national and global preparedness systems to ensure timely and equitable access to pandemic countermeasures, including vaccines, to support sustainable funding and capacity for prevention, detention, and responses to outbreak, and promote mutual trust. And he suggested that the treaty would be taken forward by the World Health Assembly and based in, uh, in on the WHO's constitution, including the principles of health for all, and of course, non-discrimination. I'm not suggesting that the pandemic treaty will be the focus of global health, but certainly that is one of the items on the global agenda. And today we have two leading experts on global, global health as the moderators for a distinguished panel, which brings us perspectives from three key countries in Asia. Uh, and I'll just tee up uh, who those moderators are so that you can identify them uh, and their work. Uh, hopefully not during the conference, but uh, afterwards you can look them up. Aliette uh, Berman is the lead of Global Health and Governance and Senior Research Fellow at the National University of Singapore Center for International Law, which is of course the co-sponsor of today's special event. She's an adjunct assistant professor at the NUS Faculty of Law, co-chair of the American Society of International Law and International Organizations Interest Group, and her work focuses on global regulation and governance, particularly global health law and international investment law. Prior to entering academe, she practiced international trade law at Sidley Austin, and she holds a PhD in international law, DEA, in international law and political science uh, from the Graduate Institute in, in Geneva, and an LLB from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Gianluca Berchi is an adjunct professor of international law at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, director of the joint LLM on global health law and governance between the Graduate Institute and Georgetown Law School, and also a visiting professor at Georgetown University School of Law. He served in the legal office of the World Health Organization from 1998 to 2016 and was its legal counsel from 2005 to 2016. He previously served in the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, and the Office of the Legal Counsel of the UN. And he was designated focal point for UN economic sanctions during that time. During his service in the WHO, he was involved in negotiation and implementation of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and the revision and implementation of the international health regs, uh, as well as being uh, responsible during the time of the response to uh, the H1N1 influenza pandemic and the Ebola uh, crises as well. Uh, so he well knows the insides of uh, WHO reform. With that, I'll turn it over to our moderators who will tee up our, our wonderful panelists uh, and hopefully a great discussion. Take it over, Professor Perman. Thank you very much, Professor Alvarez. It's an absolute delight to be here today and to be moderating this um, important panel. Um, I think what we aim to do with the panel today is threefold. Um, our first goal is to try to understand, um, looking at global health governance, what 
went well and what did not go so well in the response to the pandemic. Building on that, what we try to do, what we'll try to do is try to think how then should or could the global health architecture, global health governance change going forward? And then at the third level, we really want to look at this from an Asian perspective. Um, so against this background, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Satozi Ezo. Um, perhaps he could go online so we can see him uh, with his video. So I could introduce him. Thank you. Hi. Um, so Dr. Ezo has worked in Japan's public health and global health arena for decades. Currently, he serves as Director of Global Health Policy Division, the International Cooperation Bureau of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Previously, he was Counselor of the Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations, where he was instrumental in facilitating UN General Assembly high-level meetings on tuberculosis and universal health coverage. He was the first appointed Senior Coordinator for Global Health, where he was involved in WHO emergency reform. He started his career at the Ministry of Health in Japan in 2002, and he was also in the past seconded to an AIDS headquarters in Geneva. Dr. Zhou holds a PhD in public health from Nintendo University, an MD from National Saga Medical School, and an MPA, MPH in global health from Harvard Kennedy School. Great to have you here, Dr. Zhou. Our second speaker is uh, Mr. Jeremy Lee. Jeremy, perhaps you could go on video. He's the director of the Leadership Institute for Global Health Transformation at the National University of Singapore School of Public Health. He's also co-founder and CEO of Amili, the first dedicated gut microbiome full service company in Southeast Asia. Jeremy has a special interest in ways that technology can increase health equity and access to care. Um, He's, Jeremy has also worked in executive roles in public and private sectors, including as senior official in Singapore's Ministry of Health. And he's a, he's a member of the Royal College of Surgeons and holds a Master's of Medicine from NUS and a Master's of Public Health from John Hopkins. Hi, Jeremy. Great to have you here. Um, finally, Professor Wang Ching Wang is a member of China's National Expert Committee of COVID-19. He's executive vice chairman of the Chinese Society of Health Law and a professor of law at Tsinghua University, where he was a founding director of the Health Research Center. He has served as dean of the Tsinghua University School of Law. He holds a BA in literature from Peking University, an LLM and JSD from Peking University, and an LLM from University. It's great to have you here today with us. And I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Uh, before we do what I thought I would do, is to kind of um, frame the discussion with highlighting some of the conceptual areas where I think we already already have some sense of what went well and what did not go so well with uh, the pandemic response. Um, so I'll do it very shortly and then we can discuss this, of course, in the course of the panel. So I think one area where there's quite a sense that went very well is science, vaccine development. I mean, it's quite miraculously after a year with it, uh, since the outbreak, we have um, we have a vaccine. Um, we might have an opportunity to talk about how, what the reasons are that that went so well, what decisions and actions were taken over the years that have led us to this um, super situation with respect to vaccines. Uh, the areas where I think there is quite already a sense that have not gone well, I want to mention four areas, which I hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss uh, in the course of the panel. I think the first area is, an, is the matter of prevention of zoonotic diseases. So if we look at COVID, of course, it's a zoonotic disease, but if we look at the epidemics in, re in the past years, be it Ebola or Zika and so forth, these are all zoonotic diseases. Um, public health experts have not been surprised by COVID. Um, and so, and they're all warning us that this is something uh, which is, that the next pandemic is imminent. Um, as of now, there is no international legal framework that deals with this, it tries to contain it. Um, so that appears to be an area where reform might be warranted. Uh, the second element is a global alert system. I think by now we've all heard criticisms of China not notifying early enough and the WHO not acting fast enough. So there is a clear sense that something with our global alert system isn't working well enough. And there are already all kinds of ideas floating around about how that could possibly improve. So I hope we'll 
also have an opportunity uh, to talk about that. The third element is the issue of response in countries. So we see that the same vi virus ha has hit countries around the world, but the outcome has been very different. So that tells us something that some countries have been better than others at managing this. Um, and then the question is, of course, Asia, many Asian countries, of course, have done well above average in their response. And then the question is really, what can we learn the countries that have not been so successful from them? And also what role does international legal uh, infrastructure that we have um, have in improving capacity and response in countries that haven't done so well. Um, and the last issue I think is quite obviously access to vaccines. So the situation we have now is um, that high income countries have bought up most of the vaccines and despite uh, multilateral efforts, most uh, notably COVAX, to improve access in low uh, income countries, there is quite a big disparity. And um, this is also is an issue that as of yet has not been dealt with um, in an international legal or governance framework. So it's really very much ad hoc being developed as we speak and going forward, we need to think, how do we do this better? Because of course, um, equal ac access to vaccines is not only an altruistic matter, but really also very critical in bringing an end uh, to this pandemic. Um, so a, a fifth element that I wanna highlight, and this speaks to what uh, Professor Alvarez mentioned, he mentioned the pandemic treaty that is now being discussed. So is, if we think about reform, uh, through what means do we do it? Do we reform the international health regulations? Do we really need a new treaty? Do we do it through the WHO? Do we need a new body? So these are all things, all of these issues, substantive issues that need treatment, how, through what kind of legal or governance mechanisms do we do it and which actors do we wanna have involved? Is it governments or is, do we also need the private sector um, and civil society and so forth? And of course, finally, any kind of reform in the end really depends on political will and funding. And these are really the major questions. Will we have the, the political will and the funding necessary to undertake um, reforms? So with all that being said, um, I'd like to move on to, the, to, the, to our panelists. I will just mention to our audience that if you have questions, please do uh, submit them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And we will, in the course of the second hour, address as, um, these questions. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Izzo. If you could please give us uh, your remarks. I'll just um, remind our audience or tell our audience that we asked our panelists to address two main questions. First of all, to try to understand what went well and what did not go so well and where we should uh, think of in terms of reform, what should be our steps uh, going forward at the WHO or beyond uh, in terms of reforming uh, the global health architecture. So please to you, Dr. Izzo. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Satoshi Izzo, uh, quite currently at the foreign ministry uh, heading the global health team here, uh, including uh, COVID-19. Um, but uh, my presentation is from a rather personal and professional uh, point of view. And uh, <clears throat> so I, what I will do is that I will firstly um, talk about the, our uh, national uh, response to COVID-19 and uh, followed by our uh, global sort of contribution to the, to the global response. And finally, I will just touch upon uh, some key uh, areas that I think uh, we should be doing to reform the, the whole global health system. Uh, so first of all, um, <clears throat> if you look at this uh, slide, a uh, comparison of the, uh, the, the number of deaths per, uh, per population. Uh, sorry. Uh, as you can see, um, so well, uh, among the G20 uh, countries, uh, Japan uh, and others, like uh, other uh, Asian countries like China, uh, uh, South Korea and Australia are uh, among the lower uh, end of uh, the spectrum. And then I would not say that this is a success story, but uh, we could just uh, say that uh, we have been relatively successful in uh, contain, controlling the, the mortality from COVID-19, relatively speaking. And uh, this is another sort of uh, illustrative 
uh, slide uh, comparing, uh, in this case, Japan uh, with uh, other European uh, uh, colleagues, counterparts. Um, and uh, this is the, the basically the, the whole epic curve of uh, the, the Japanese uh, situation uh, from uh, the, the, the beginning of the last year. And then we have had some spikes and the major spike recently uh, was the, uh, the uh, to, uh, around uh, the end of December uh, towards uh, February, um, January, February time. Dr. Lim, would you like to continue instead? Yeah, really. Okay. Yeah. Certainly, Professor Berman. Yeah, and thank you for the invitation. And it is a delight to to well, to spend a midweek evening to learn from my esteemed legal colleagues. Uh, I think Shatoshi and I are, are two of the medical doctors who are who are in this forum. And perhaps I will speak as a as a Singaporean and also as a medical uh, and and as a medical practitioner and as a public health professor. Uh, but I I do want to make four four quick points, but before that, uh, can I just preamble that the World Health Organization is really a member's organization. Other than the international health regulations and the FCTC, there are actually very few globally, uh, I, and perhaps binding is even too strong a word, but uh, it's really... Uh, the World Health Organization draws its strength from its members and by the and and really by its standing and its moral suasion. So to cut a long story short, the WHO is only as good as its members allow it to be. Uh, second comment that I'll make as a as a preamble is that ever since I began practicing medicine as well as public health almost 30 years ago, um, countries have have typically selectively listened to the WHO even in the best of times. So outside of pandemics, when WHO issues uh, guidance on, on universal health coverage, uh, minimum amount of uh, GDP spent on healthcare, um, countries have tended to be selective listeners and picking and choosing perhaps the choice pieces that most resonate with countries' own political ideology as well as uh, particular state uh, and as well as particular circumstances at that point in time. So it is what it is. Uh, we are not here to uh, argue over the past, but let's just uh, focus on the future moving forward. And the four points I would like to make, the first is that as a small country, uh, Singapore looks to the, the WHO really for leadership, for guidance, and in many instances for that moral arbitration. And I think that we saw that countries during the most uh, difficult times in the pandemic, uh, shortages of masks and medicines and now vaccines, that it's uh, every man and woman for himself or for herself. I'm not sure what WHO uh, could have done beyond uh, what Dr. Tedros had already uh, had and has already been doing in using the so-called soapbox or the bully pulpit of the World Health Organization to to exhort and urge members to essentially do the right thing and to appeal to their to their better angels. But my but my sense uh, from the ground is that oftentimes these these exhortations have fallen on on really deaf ears. Um, but we do hope that in the future, moving forward, we can design a system where the WHO's moral voice rings louder. Uh, second comment I will make, which is very specific to us here in Asia, is that regional collaborations are important. And as the pandemic has, has richly illustrated, more and more important. I think it has been said that, and there's a, there's a Chinese saying that, that distant water cannot put out a near fire and and countries need to organize 
better at the regional level. And in Asia, for historic reasons, the WHO has divided the region into Sierra, our Southeast Asia, and Wipro, the Western Pacific. And, and for us, in uh, sitting in Singapore and in Southeast Asia, uh, ASEAN is probably one of the uh, more uh, more resonating collaborations uh, with ample opportunities for for member countries of ASEAN to interact with each other, but but the WHO organization, which is largely around historic uh, reasons, is probably no longer fit for purpose and deserves a look during reforms. The third point that I'll make. Um, is that of surge capacity and who should be responsible for this and who should coordinate. And I'm not just referring to really emergency supplies of gloves, face masks, um, medicines and so on, but even human capital. Um, and I'm struck that very early on in the, in the crisis, WHO put out a call to all public health professionals who had experience working in international settings to step forward and support the WHO. And many of my colleagues were, were really torn between staying in Singapore to prepare for the pandemic that, pretty, that, that would come to Singapore's shores or stepping forward to support the WHO in its global mandate. And perhaps... Um, with the lessons out of COVID-19, uh, the world can be much more deliberate, much more in intentional about surge capacity, both human infrastructure and, and, really con and medical supplies and other consumables. Um, and maybe the last point that I'll make, uh, and I'm very sympathetic to, w to the WHO for its evolving guidance, um, because uh, COVID or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it is a novel virus. All of us learned as we went along. But I guess it would have been helpful if WHO had, had represented more emphatically the uncertainty that it was experiencing when it came to guidance so that and really be a more effective clearinghouse and simply report or describe what the various member states do and leave countries to to, I guess, um, look at the data themselves and come to their own conclusions. And maybe to build on this point, one other comment that I'll make is that um, um, moving forward after COVID-19 has passed, hopefully, and we come to the light at the end of the tunnel, I do hope that the lessons learned out of COVID-19 can be captured in a useful global repository that ideally should be held by the WHO and, and that the world and that the WHO proactively um, calls out to countries, not just for the pandemic, but the knock-on effects. I mean, um, given what we what we were anticipating and what we now know has played out. Uh, issues like mental health, issues like uh, like excess mortality in other in in other diseases. Many of these were recognized by public health professionals early on, and I guess even as we are fighting, even as many of our public health colleagues are fighting the immediate fire, who's essentially looking over the horizon to worry about the ones that are coming, the economic carnage that follow, the mental health uh, catastrophe that the world is uh, really looking at. And perhaps uh, some really technical guidance in this area uh, would have been useful uh, much, much earlier on. And on this note, I will end my comments and I'll hand the time back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lim. I hope we'll be able to elaborate more and get into more details about these issues um, in the second part of our seminar. Good morning or good evening to everyone. And thank you very much for offering this opportunity for me to uh, express my personal views regarding the various issues of reforming the current international public health regime, uh, particularly WHO and also the International Health uh, Regulation, IHRA. So these are all the current and uh, topical issues facing to every country and also every person as well. Uh, so I agree with uh, 
previous speakers' views, particularly regarding the authority and also uh, the kind of uh, role played by WHO, uh, which is really based on the member states. Its strength is coming from the member states' endorsement and its operation based on the coordination and the cooperation uh, from all the member states. So I, I think all of these are very good points, and particularly when we, when we review the current international public health regime. And COVID-19, of course, is um, such an unprecedented event, uh, causing so much, well, severe damages to every country, to all peoples. But the unique thing of this pandemic is that it's new, it's novel. There are so many unknowns and also uncertainties and presented by this new pandemic. So generally speaking, I would say WHO and the current global public health regime under WHO's guidance works quite well. And before the current crisis, there have been various efforts and ways by the WHO to push for each member states to reforming its public health regime or system and to uh, make their national system in line with IHR. There are so many efforts that's been already well uh, pushed and uh, uh, exerted on the current international regime. And also the step to establish the reporting system and to strengthen the preparedness of every country member states. So there have been so much has been done while we are looking particularly critically examining the current system, we should be objective, recognizing the works, efforts has been done. And also during the crisis, uh, I, I think uh, there are technical assistance offered by WHO and in the form of, mainly in the form of sharing information and issuing guidance and new therapies ways of protection, etc. There are so much have been done. And of course, well, reviewing the situation, uh, deciding the fix, this is a particular uh, contribution, I think in this uh, current crisis, the WHO has been mobilized all the efforts trying to identify the deadly disease, you know, the, the barriers, which is unknown, and also quickly make a decision. Uh, this is the uh, fake public health emergency of international concern. And also quite creatively coming up with some new mechanisms such as COVAX, as one of the major pillar of ACT Accelerator. So there have been done uh, so much by the WHO and the current international public health regime, but it does not mean there are no defects or misfunctions or loopholes in the current regime. As the centerpiece of the global public health regime, the authority of WHO in promoting global solidarity and informing joint international actions and efforts, such as coordinating the ways and the measures of containment of the virus in various regions and countries, providing technical assistance should be further strengthened or respected. I mean, well, playing as the central 
or key player in such an international regime by WHO. I mean, the WHO's authority is kind of uh, function for coordinating the global efforts should be respected and enforced. And even though there are problems in operation and defects in its mechanisms and structures, and such as coordination within the WHO among different divisions and offices, we can say sometimes it's not very smooth. Sometimes there are different um, kind of voices. And also particularly is cooperation with member states. It should be further supported. I mean, the WHO and also uh, the current uh, international public health regime rather than dismantled or its leading position or center kind of key role as the position of WHO be downplayed. So otherwise, we will create more problems rather than solving the current problems. And also, I would like to say, not only the reform of the current regime, the structure, the procedure, etc., should be well addressed, but also, or perhaps more importantly, it is the implementation of the current IHR or is a function of the mechanisms and should be addressed as well. In my personal view, the implementation has more problems rather than the rules on the paper or the mechani mechanisms in the organization. So if we fix up the whole procedure of cooperation from early sharing information and issuing the guidance and providing assistance and reviewing and also kind of uh, tracing the various, all these are based on cooperation from member states. But the fact is that we are facing, we are in the stage of nation states, kind of a global village, but all the villagers are independent nation states. If WHO is the clinic of the village, we cannot always look at the clinic and trying to find, but of course we should do that, the problems with the clinic. But we also need to find out what about each individual villagers, nation stage, your cooperation with WHO, your willingness to participate in this international public health regime, rather than withdrawing, rather than blocking, rather than splitting the efforts, joint efforts. So I think the implementation should be at least equally emphasized while we're trying to reform. Now, I, I don't want to well, go on too long, <clears throat> but if we consider preparedness, all these current mechanics, mechanisms function well, that's the expectation. That's one part of the joint efforts in coping with the current pandemic. Another part is that we should respond. There are two points, preparedness and the response. Preparedness and 
ILAC suggested a mention to China in the early stage. It is widely supposed has been in some kind of delay in communicating with WHO. I do not want to we'll get into that point to open another debate, but we respect the WHO's review and we're uh, looking forward for the review panel, independent review, review panel's uh, report. So we'll, we, we, we were facing a new variant. It's unknown and it's a deadly situation. And if we're comparing with the year of 2003 and of the crisis of, uh, 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 of, of the, uh, what is the term so, uh, in, in that kind of epidemic, and, uh, we are actually in a much better position in quickly speed up to, to actually to separate the various, to identify the various, and to sharing the information with the WHO and the international community. So I think that's one part response. So we could say that there are enormous problems of response by member states. There are various ways. I'm not going to give any kind of judgment which way is better, which way is uh, well needs to be improved. But I just uh, trying to point it out. There are different ways of countries or member states response. This response takes so long and we can see the different results. I think the first speaker, Dr. Uh, Izzo, already mentioned, we can see the chart, the differences. We're looking for his further explanation. And this is another, well, so prolonged period for response. And in this kind of response, process of response, what should be the WHO's role and the member states, well, cooperation or implementation, etc. I think there's a huge area need to be looked in to find out what are the loopholes, what are the defects of the current regime in terms of procedure standards and also possible ways of containment, etc. So there are so much we need to discuss. So, well, put a long story short, I, I should, uh, I, I think I, I should not uh, step over my time uh, limit. And let me just uh, cut it to long story short to use a Chinese metaphor. When we examine the problems, we should not only pick up the telescope looking at others. We should also pick up the microscope, examining ourselves and whether there are proper cooperation, readiness or willingness to cooperate. If there is no joint efforts, if there is no solidarity, I do not think any single state would be safe unless everyone, every region is safe. So joint efforts. So in this term, multilateralism, solidarity should be the catching slogan, not only for WHO, but for every country. So uh, I, 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 I think I just uh, give uh, four uh, or five bulletin points. Number one, it is not only the WHO or the global public health regime which needs to be reformed, but all member states and partners 
need to consider how to cooperate and work with the WHO, how to function within such a global village with a shared fate or destination. And secondly, we always try to establish an ideal or perfect system while we're discussing reform. We have a kind of uh, image in our mind, this ideal image. But I would say we need to be more practical. Recognizing there are unknowns, there are uncertainties, there are scientific, well, incompleteness. Therefore, we need to design a system with some scope of flexibility and feasibility. Flexibility is based on scientific evidence. It's not leaving loopholes, but there should be kind of flexibility. And also in this regime, there should be encouragement rather than blaming or let alone, well, kind of stigma thing. So I, I, I think there are so many issues we need to consider. That's the second point. So we need to be more practical and uh, also uh, more scientific in designing a kind of regime which could cope with future unknown varies unknown pandemics. To so look back after every international public health crisis, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, we change a little bit of this part or that part, but we cannot exhaust all the future possibilities which are unknown. So what is the ideal system? And thirdly, technical assistance is badly needed. It is not only assistance of review and comments. We also need more concrete assistance by therapeutical or pharmaceutical or logistic assistance. Make it more real, particularly for all these uh, developing countries. And fourthly, Coordination with member states is one of the key points and which could be help for joint efforts and joint actions against not only current pandemic, but also future pandemics. And we should involve more developing countries. We are, well, experts. And we have our voices. But look at the majority of areas in developing countries. Do they participate? Do they really consider what is the mechanic which fits into their system or helping them? Okay, I, I should not put too much. And finally, the fifth, fifth one is that the new pandemic treaty is a good idea. I personally welcome it, but we need to be careful. We should not create another system without a bridge or without actually merge it with the current international public health well, regime. Thank you all. I, I think I talked too much. I apologize for overstepping my time limit. Thank you, Professor Wang. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Izzo, let's try again. Hopefully it works this time. Let me just start from where I left. Sorry for the uh, long recess. And uh, technically speaking, I think that the time for the three panelists are already up, but let me try to, to go over some, some of the points, uh, um, hopefully quickly. So, so this is the, the basic policy of Japan. Uh, the next, next one, please. Can you go to the next slide? 
Yes, so uh, I think we sum so I, I summarized uh, three points uh, in the, ja the Japanese response to COVID-19. And first one is cluster-based approach. I, don't, I won't go into detail, this is not a public health conference, but uh, uh, one of the, the advantage of our approach was to uh, uh, focus on clusters. And, and of course, and also not, not only we, uh, contact, we did contact tracing prospectively, which is the common, common method, but we also did uh, retrospective contact tracing to identify the common uh, source of infection, uh, be it uh, like karaoke bar or um, some restaurant so that we can, we can uh, have a uh, focused approach. Uh, next one, please. And the second uh, uh, approach uh, point is uh, the evidence-based communication. Uh, and uh, this is what we call uh, three Cs. Well, in Japanese, it's called Sanmitsu. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, all, uh, again, uh, based on scientific uh, background. We analyzed uh, initial cases uh, and we found out that there are common uh, sort of denominators uh, in terms of uh, super spreading event, which uh, included three uh, conditions. One is closed spaces, and the second is crowded places, and the third one is closed contact settings, uh, which was uh, Bay China and our own as well, scientific science-based uh, communication strategy to let the public know that they need to really avoid those uh, three C situation. And which proved to be uh, successful. Um, and this three C, the word three C. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Can you move on to the next slide? Yes, so uh, this uh, 3C approach, uh, San Mitsu, uh, was translated into WHO guidance uh, in, in Wipro, uh, the Western Pacific region, which is an interesting direction. But uh, so uh, this 3C or San Mitsu was, uh, we, we really were successful in uh, advertising this uh, to the general public. So that uh, this, call, this term called Samitsu or 3C uh, became the national buzzword of, of last year. So this is the, the, the number two. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. And then number three, so this is universal health coverage. So um, Japan has been a key uh, advocator for uh, promoting universal health coverage uh, around the world and from the, the prime minister's level. And this article uh, was uh, from uh, December uh, in 2019, uh, before COVID-19, but uh, uh, basically, we were advocating for providing basic uh, healthcare to all, all the people. And this was also, uh, th this would also uh, prepare people in the countries uh, from pandemics that we are experiencing now. And we do have our own uh, UHC system, uh, which uh, we th believe that uh, uh, assisted and helped us uh, in our own response. Um, next slide, please. Yes, and in terms of our global uh, sort of assistance uh, and, uh, and, and the, the Prime Minister Suga and the Foreign Minister uh, Motegi has been also uh, still advocating for UHC uh, in, our, uh, in the global uh, response to COVID-19. Next slide, please.
I will not go into detail, obviously, but uh, we have been uh, just uh, from uh, March uh, in uh, last year, we started uh, really early on uh, the, this global uh, assistance uh, to developing countries. And uh, we have provided over 1.5 billion uh, US dollars uh, for assisting uh, through multilateral organizations or bilaterally. And also we have established a loan uh, uh, fund uh, to assist this, uh, including in Asia Pacific region. Uh, next one, please. Yes, and as our um, colleague uh, also mentioned, uh, we have be, we, we are uh, initiate one of the initiator country of the uh, Act Accelerator, uh, and uh, and uh, as you know, uh, this is a new uh, sort of uh, architecture or governance mechanism for COVID nineteen uh, global tools, including vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics and health systems, and. Um, we, maybe we could discuss more uh, if time allows uh, in the discussion part uh, about uh, this COVAX and vaccines, but we are proud to be able to uh, initiate this uh, architecture. This is not perfect, but I think we can, we can uh, build on this existing new mechanism when we think about the, 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 the uh, new global health architecture. Maybe we could elaborate more on this. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and uh, lastly, uh, I would just some direction for the WHO reform. This is actually not only uh, about WHO, uh, this is about the global health architecture, but uh, I just wanted to, to, to um, share uh, our uh, current view uh, around the direction of this. And uh, so I think the, uh, the, the basic principle should be around, uh, again, universal health coverage, which is to leave no one's health behind. And I think this is the key to all the COVID-19 response and beyond. So I, I, we, we would like to, to really reiterate the importance of universal health coverage. And uh, with that, uh, we have three sort of general directions and key areas. One is to strengthen the capacity of health services provision, including uh, the prevention, diagnostics, and treatment uh, for immediate COVID-19 crisis. This is uh, the, the immediate response area. And the second one is a longer term. Uh, area, which is to strengthen the quality, resilient, and inclusive health systems to prepare for future health crises like this. And the third one is a broader area uh, to enhance health security uh, through uh, broader sectors like primary health care, education, gender, nutrition uh, in the con in, under the, uh, the umbrella of One Health approach. And next one, please. So um, I think uh, that uh, we need to be, when we think about the, the well, uh, new or updated global health architecture, I think we have to think from what key functions uh, we do need as a, as a global citizens. And so uh, this is just uh, one uh, example of how to divide up those key uh, uh, elements or functions. And uh, I think there may be about six, uh, at least. One is the leadership and coordination role. And the second one is norm setting, uh, like uh, issuing guidance, guidance and guidelines. And the th third one is the technical advice. And the fourth one is uh, actual operation uh, on the field. And the fifth one is resource mobilization. And the sixth is uh, research and development. And so the question is that whether the WHO should do all of it. And it is evident that uh, WHO, well, from us at least, from me, WHO should uh, continue to play its leading role as, as our, our previous speaker uh, mentioned. 
but it is also clear that the WHO alone cannot do the do the, the whole work and then and in fact uh, there are this uh, new uh, architecture uh, called act accelerator of course it has its own challenges but the point of that new architecture is that we need to divide up um, and uh, have a division of labor uh, leveraging each organization's uh, strength and so uh, my uh, Mm, current analysis, and of course, we need to discuss thoroughly on this, uh, building on the ongoing independent panel uh, review or IHR review committee uh, recommendations and others. But our um, current, at least my own current analysis uh, around uh, these functions is that um, in terms of the WHO, uh, I believe that uh, the WHO should continue to lead on the number one leadership and coordination and also norm settings, uh, issuing guide, uh, guidelines and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and those technical advice uh, based on scientific evidence. Uh, even though there's no conclusive evidence, we turn to WHO for their uh, best available uh, advice from the technical point of view. So number two and number three should uh, continue to be WHO's sort of um, uh, bread and butter uh, uh, in their uh, leading role. But the question is, uh, I mean, it, it, it is becoming less clear around uh, to what extent uh, WHO should be leading on the, the, the number four operation and resource number five resource mobilization and also research and development. Maybe we could tap others, uh, other UN organizations or other um, sectors, uh, private sector or civil society organizations uh, when we think about those uh, latter three uh, elements. Well, I, I won't go into further detail. Maybe we could discuss uh, more. Um, please, uh, next slide, please. This is the last slide. I won't spend too much on this as well. Uh, and, but the, the priority areas for me uh, in going forward in uh, reforming the, the global health architecture, uh, especially the WHO, uh, is to, is, uh, well, uh, it is laid out here. Um, and strengthen WHO's role, uh, improvement of WHO's capacities for health security, and strengthen the, uh, the improvement of IHR implementation and from the IHR review committee of the WHO, and the other promotion of international cooperation uh, for the implementation of IHR, building our own our lessons and improvement of WHO's governance. Now we have three layers, uh, head headquarters, regional office, and uh, country offices. It has its unique advantages, but maybe there are some room for improvement. And also we do have uh, executive board, uh, as well as the, the, uh, the World Health Assembly. And maybe we should be thinking about how to uh, strengthen the, the executive board. Um, and also uh, the, the improvement of funding mechanism for WHO. I, we believe that there are ongoing uh, different streams uh, of discussions under G7, G20, and, uh, the, and, and also under the independent panel about sustainable financing of the WHO. Uh, and uh, we are really um, uh, looking forward to more robust uh, financing mechanism for uh, the, the WHO and, and the whole global health security arena for more um, uh, preparedness and prevention. Um, lastly, uh, last word. So uh, I personally have been uh, involved in the global health uh, policy and diplomacy uh, uh, from the area of, era of uh, the, the, the Ebola uh, crisis. Um, in 2014, and there are lots of uh, different uh, recommendations uh, made uh, uh, based on the lessons learned, and then uh, including the, the well, in, uh, high-level panel uh, from the Secretary General or the um, 
National Academy of Medicine or uh, Graduate Institute and others. And uh, there are very, very good recommendations, but the problem was that uh, uh, people tend to, to have a, a cycle of uh, panic and neglect. Uh, if I, uh, I think this was, uh, uh, I heard this uh, term from uh, uh, Dr. Jim Kim from the, the former president of the World Bank. Uh, but uh, I think we, uh, we uh, were not uh, as successful as it, uh, the, the recommendation has suggested us to do as a global community. So uh, this time around, we really need to be thinking about how to really practically move things forward to, to, uh, for us to really, really better prepare for the next one. Uh, so with that, I am looking forward to further discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zhou. Um, I have a lot of follow-up questions on all of these issues, but what I'd like to do now is actually hand um, the lead to um, my co-moderator, Professor Burki, and uh, I believe he'd like to also ask some um, questions. So to you, Gianluca. Thank you, Ayelet, and many thanks to the three panelists. Uh, as uh, Ayelet says, uh, quite a huge amount of, uh, of considerations or proposal, uh, both looking um, inward and, <clears throat> and outward. So difficult to distill uh, some priority question because there are so many. But to start it off, and, and going back to the metaphor that Professor Wang was using, using the microscope and the telescope, I would like maybe to start with a couple of questions using first the microscope and then the telescope. The microscope is <clears throat> looking at your records and more broadly at the record of Asian countries. Uh, Dr. Ezoe has showed us in graphically the approach used by Japan in trying to control the spread of COVID, uh, cluster approach and, and so on. Um, but if we, if we look more broadly and comparing also with Western Europe, I'm, I'm Italian, I live in Switzerland, and frankly, I don't see a, <clears throat> a quick and painless way out of the current lockdown and, and, and mis general misery. And we look in some envy at Asian countries, at Singapore, at China, at Japan, at uh, Korea, at Taiwan. Um, so... Is there an Asian way? Uh, obviously, every country has its own approach, has its own social and political features that drives uh, the particular brand of response. I remember one year ago, back in January, February, we were all looking at the uh, draconian lockdown on Wuhan and shaking our head and saying, this will never happen in Europe. And we, we all did what China did, started with my country, with Italy. So. There, are, there, there have been winning models, but can, from your vantage point and based on your uh, experience in your country, but also looking around your neighborhood, uh, what are, what are the, 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 the features, the characteristics, the driver of success of Asian country? Because you really can generalize um, a, a success in control. Looking further afield, you can also look to, to uh, New Zealand, to Australia, uh, as also other success stories, obviously with some slippages, but nothing compared to uh, North America and, and Western Europe. And in looking at your, uh, what you've done, what other countries in your regions have done, what has been WHO's role? WHO has been very active, as you all said, they recognize putting out guidance, uh, temporary recommendations or information, uh, constantly evolving guidance. Did they play a role? Uh, did your countries and other countries in your region look at WHO's guidance uh, and used it? And did it make a difference? Or you followed your own way uh, without particular attention to what WHO was, was recommending, was a Advising. So again, the country approach. Um, I don't have any particular order. Maybe we start with Dr. Lim. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, I would say that that Singapore's first stumble was the obstinate 
that um, attitude towards mask. And perhaps rightly or wrongly, the government's position was that the WHO did not recommend routine use of mask. And this was subsequently severely criticized. I do wonder whether the WHO was just a convenient um, scapegoat for these for the actions that the Singapore government took. Um, but I think that that experience very early on coloured um, the Singapore public's um, um, attitude and conviction in the advice of the World Health Organization. And uh, to be quite honest, um, because we uh, because Singapore has very competent public health officials um, and we had a multi-ministerial task force that met every single day, sometimes twice or three times a day. Um, there was ample senior level decision making. I am sure that the WHO's guidance was taken into account, but it was, but beyond the the point about about whether to wear mask routinely or not, uh, the WHO's guidance did not feature prominently in the in at least public discussions of Singapore's actions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Wang. I mean, China has a lot to. Had a lot to show in a way, and uh, you 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 did lead the way. But <laughs> would like to see if you have a, a broader reflection also on other countries in your region. Well, thank you, Jan. And uh, I, I I I do not think is a pleasant way of lockdown, and I don't think most of the people like it, let alone love it. So it's a painful measure for every country, in every region, for every individual. So in the West, in the East, individual persons have the same feeling, the passion. So, but how this kind of very kind of, uh, let's say, uh, somewhat uh, coercive way has been implemented? I think number one, there are cultural differences. Mm. If you look at the beginning of the COVID-19, when it happened in China, in, well, uh, the Asian countries, people rush into the supermarket. For what? Masks, personal equipment, and food. If you look at Europe, and um, U.S., I was really amazed at why people rush into the supermarket for toilet papers. So, different cultural background. I, I mean, not Professor Wang, in, in well fairness, Singapore ran out of toilet paper also. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Yeah. There should so, be some serious but, anthropological studies about this obsession <laughs> with toilet paper in certain cultures, I guess. Right, right. Okay. So anyhow, when the whole society should be mobilized to cope with these unknown kind of various, the new challenge of the pandemic, and the key player in every country is the government. The government in public health area, generally speaking, is a key player, no matter in the West or in the East, because public health system is built upon the governmental initiative funding. No exception in everywhere. everywhere. So if the government takes a good approach, of course, through the social fabric to get the general consensus from the people, so people know this is a painful. No one likes to be locked down at home for months or for, for weeks, even for days. But if the situation is clear and the reason, particularly kind of, um, well, let's say uh, 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 public understanding has come to the same point, 
So there is a consensus. And then people know I'm suffering for the coming days or even weeks or in Wuhan for months, but eventually we will get over it and we will be more freedom, more rights could be enjoyed. So I would like to call uh, Larry Gosling from Georgetown in his famous public health law book. He says in public health area, the policy makers always face one difficulty, no matter in which place, which is the conflicts of rights conflicts of interests. You have to make a decision to make a clear line, to make a difficult choice of trade off. You cannot protect all rights. I think, well, legal philosophy tells us there are orders of legal rights in particular moment, in particular period, and facing particular issue, some rise overrides the others. It's not absolute, but we need to consider, particularly in the public health area. Let, let, let me ask, uh, sorry. Yeah, let, let, what, what about WHO's uh, recommendation? Did they play a role in your, in your policy? Did, you, did your government consider them and use them? Oh, yes. Not? Oh, gosh. Of oh, course. Well, uh, the kind of uh, suggested measures and social distance. Mm. And in China, also, we add a lot of more in public health areas, such as uh, is, uh, what is what was in, to express. You know, the Chinese people use uh, chopsticks for their meals. And generally, they don't separate the chopsticks while taking from his personal plate or from the common plate. So now we have two chopsticks for each person, one for yourself, even from your own bowl. Another is picking up dishes from the common plate. So these are all the good measures. Okay. It's a tedious. It's yeah. a kind of uh, additional work, but people accept it while well, they understand this is the good way to prevent the virus. I think the consensus is very important, but the consensus in various ways is guided by the public policy. Yeah. Yeah, excellent point. So the, the, there's a few elements that are emerging. A uh, lot of emphasis is also in, in culture. Culture makes it different, but also culture can be changed and behavior can be changed. And uh, I like what you said, Professor Wang, about the, the, the crucial role of governments, because in a way, at least in, in academia, uh, international law, international relations, we've been talking for decades about the retreat of states. Sovereignty is a, is a 20th century concept. Concept. Everything is, is uh, transboundary, is globalized. But I think COVID, as you said, has put the government back at the center. We've all been looking to the government to get to make sure that if I fell sick, I have a place in the hospitals to get vaccines. We accepted lockdown. So really, I think it leading to probably uh, rethinking uh, the, 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 the role of government, not only time of emergency, but as a provider and enforcer, as you said correctly, of, of public goods that require difficult choices for, for personal freedoms and so on. Dr. Aizue, what, what are your considerations? Well, I, I do not want to get into no. very distant uh, well, debates over the role of the government. Anyhow, uh, it's not putting back the government back into the situation, into the system. Mm. It is always there. No matter you recognize it or you well, ignore it, it's always there. It's there, but uh, for example, in, in public health, I look at Western Europe and the level of privatization on healthcare. Uh, it's there as a former supervisor to oversee, to regulate, but frankly, it has taken a step back uh, in many countries. Look at the United States, I think is one of the best examples. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, Jane. Can I just get interrupted for one moment? Sure, and then I give the floor to Dr. Ezoe. Yeah. When we look at the well, health law, and we should be clear that we are actually talking about public health law. There is another set of rules in you know, the well sub category, which is health care law. That's the kind of legal relation between physicians and patients, individual patients. Public health law deals with community health, population health. Yep. So that's a different kinds of legal relation. So I, I'm not talking about um, health care law, yeah, which definitely. should be patient centered. Yeah. But I'm talking about public health law. It's community yeah. health. No, po Sorry, point well taken, point well taken. Dr. Ezoe, uh, your, your reflection on, uh, on Japan and more, more broadly on Asia's approach to, to, to outbreak control in a way. Why success story? Yes, on the question of uh, the developments of the WHO's uh, recommendations, and we, we do listen to WHO. And we really, really respect their recommendations and take them very, very seriously. And so uh, we always turn to WHO uh, for their uh, technical guidance and technical advice. And in the case of uh, COVID-19, uh, well, uh, since there are some examples uh, like masks, uh, so in Japan, masks are really, really uh, general uh, commodity and then general measures, uh, public health measures uh, in the flu seasons. Uh, so even though there is no pandemic, we are really before the COVID-19. And which were, uh, so in, in the initial stage, WHO's guidelines was a bit uh, ambiguous around that. And then uh, their recommendation was not necessarily sort of uh, in line with our own practice. But so in that case, uh, in, uh, well, we, we went on to, to, to basically recommend masks wearing. And then the, that, uh, in, well, in this case, that proved to be uh, appropriate. So uh, there's, we, we do respect the WHO's guidelines and we continue to, to, uh, to do that. But there are some sort of like a time, time lag. Uh, well, uh, later on, WHO amended uh, with uh, the, the, their guidance on, on mask wearing, and as well as other countries, uh, technical agencies like CDC. Uh, uh, so they, they basically catched up. So in, in that case, uh, mask wearing uh, was, uh, in a, well, uh, sort of a, some country could be a, a bit ahead uh, of the WHO. And, uh, Likewise, uh, in terms of the travel restriction, so uh, not only Japan, but uh, now many countries employ travel restrictions and the WHO's tendency, or at least in the initial stage, uh, their recommendation was uh, not, not to um, aggressively uh, turn to travel restriction. Of course, we do understand the principle of measures, um, uh, but uh, so we we believe that there are some merits uh, in travel restrictions. Of course, we need to try to always minimize that measures. It has economic implications and and all others. But uh, uh, I think this is another area that we should uh, sort of uh, invest. Well, uh, we should dig deeper, and then uh, which, which is which is currently done, I believe, uh, under the, uh, the, the independent panel and others. And also uh, in reviewing the IHR, I think those uh, technical, uh, uh, well, strengthening those, uh, you know, capacity for technical guidance, uh, including, uh, for example, those areas of mask wearing or the, 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 tra the travel restrictions. We, uh, I think those are some examples of uh, some sort of a deep, deeper understanding and the, the strengthening of the technical issues. Uh, and uh, in terms of the Asian uh, uh, sort of uh, commonalities, I, I am not in a position to represent all that this diverse, uh, culturally diverse and uh, very, um, uh, well, uh, area of, of Asia Pacific, but 
Uh, I do think uh, from the uh, public health expert point of view, uh, we have lots of experience uh, in tackling those uh, uh, pandemic or um, infectious disease uh, uh, threats, uh, including SARS in 2003 or um, the avian flu, uh, swine flu, uh, and uh, also MERS. Uh, and so I think, uh, Relatively speaking, we are more uh, ready uh, and we do have our hands-on experience in countering uh, those uh, infectious disease uh, epidemics. Uh, so that's one sort of uh, uh, characteristics of this area and which proved to be, well, which I believe have contributed uh, to some extent in, in yeah. tackling this uh, COVID. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. And um, WHO itself, I think, has made it that um, Asian countries have been uh, exposed to quite a number of outbreaks in the last 20, 25 years. So uh, I think you have built on those lessons uh, and that makes it makes a big difference. I think certainly Western Europe has a, has a fraction of the of the of the uh, big outbreaks that Asia has experienced. So practice and lessons learned that goes back also to, I believe, I believe Dr. Lim was talking about WHO maybe building a repository of lessons learned, not losing what, what we learned. And that can be also one of the, of the areas to, uh, to live for, for the future, uh, what have been the best, uh, the, the, the best lessons. I'll, I'll hand the, the floor back to, uh, to ILET, but just one comment on WHO. Uh, moderators shouldn't be advocates, but I worked at 18 years in WHO, so I have my biases. And... Uh, WHO has been criticized for be having been ambiguous, having taken too long on question on masks, on human to human transmission, on the pathway of transmission, droplets versus uh, particles and so on. It, it's true. Uh, at the same time, WHO cannot be quicker than science, and science has been very uh, ambiguous, very limited, and constantly evolving. And second, and that's something I think that needs a discussion for the future, WHO has not used a precautionary approach, has not gone ahead with very limited information, has waited to have more science, to behave like a ministry of health in a way, not a, like, a, like a university that sort of speaks out and publishes an article. So there is a fundamental philosophy to public health guidance there that WHO is very attached to. But if it hasn't worked well, I think it's an important message for WHO that you need to see a more no regrets approach, a more precautionary. And even if it's ahead of the game and things go in a different direction later. But that's, I think, a, uh, a fundamental difference in how WHO has acted and how many people would have acted to act in retrospect. And Musk is an example, I think. So with that, uh, oh, <laughs> having defended I my mean, former yeah. employer, <laughs> I, I, I handed, give the floor back to Ayelet. And sorry, Jeremy, sorry yes. but but before, uh, can I just chime in that in medicine, we have a common saying that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, of absence. <laughs> and and in the fast moving crisis people do need guidance right and in the absence of of any guidance and we can take this question from mr ong later about misinformation but essentially conspiracy theories and really alternate or even totally wacky ideas uh, gain traction in the absence of really authoritative voices. So there is a vacuum that I guess is WHO's um, guidance, even if it's soft, the least bad of the options to take forward. Good point. Take the point. Sorry, I'll add over to you. Okay, thank you so much. So just actually to also respond, uh, Gianluca's question was not... Uh, <laughs> to me, but um, I, I, I do want to respond to this issue of, uh, you know, what ex what uh, explains Asian success. We, ha we carried out a study here at the center on, you know, explaining Singapore's success, where we essentially have zero cases. We only have some important cases, but they're all caught at, at the border. So we kind of looked, and I think our main findings were threefold. First of all, Singapore has had the SARS experience in 2003, and they responded to that quite seriously. And then, you know, really set up a system, a, a preparedness system, which was very much in place when this pandemic uh, came in. 
So that was one thing. Uh, the other thing, I think if you look at government actions, they have really followed, I would say, the public health textbook. So, you know, they've very much implemented kind of the common sense public health measures um, quite strictly, be it, you know, being closing the borders or being very, very restrictive and screening the borders, keeping en those enter entering in what they call stay-at-home notice, and then really just applying all these public health measures, which we know, you know, uh, uh, this social distancing mask and so forth, and also a very, very strict and efficient contact tracing method. So these have all uh, been, you know, very important things, but I do think the social aspect, which we've all also talked about, has been absolutely crucial uh, because, you know, people in Singapore have played along and really followed the rules, not so much because of, you know, enforcement, I would say, but really as a matter of culture, so all of these together have really um, played together and have played um, really an important role. Um, and I guess I'd like also to take that as a question to the panelists. I mean, given the success in Asia, do you see Asian countries taking any kind of leadership role in, you know, I'd say teaching, you know, educating other countries how this could be done better uh, in the future? Do you get already now, you know, um, countries uh, coming to coming with with requests for uh, for assistance? So, yeah, would perhaps Dr. Lim, if you'd like to uh, yeah, sure. um, address that. Thanks, Alet. Um, maybe I'll just add to your to your uh, insights around Singapore that there's one other factor that certainly helped a lot, and that's money. Right, and Singapore has lots and lots of money, uh, money to pay people to stay at home despite not working, uh, money to pay for uh, COVID testing, for hospitalizations, and all of this. So, so the the immense resources that the Singapore government was able to mobilize and was politically prepared to put into COVID for for citizens, for migrant workers, and so on, really made a very large difference. Um, I would say that one of the consequences of of the pandemic as it stands today is that yes, uh, uh, at least we in the National University of Singapore have had a, 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 a real influx of interest in capacity building. We've been invited to multiple countries to share our experiences. Uh, and, and I would qualify that that's what we are prepared to do. We're prepared to share our experiences, but we certainly recognize Singapore is very unique and that we'll share what we have learned, the mistakes that we have made. And and as and my position when I do consultations for the WHO or for the World Bank is that is that we can be the experts in health system strengthening, universal health coverage, but we'll never be country experts. The citizens of the country are the country experts. Take our take our experience and put it into your unique country context and you decide what is best for you. Right. And and in a sense, we are just one reference point. Um we have as a school also, as a school of public health, have decided to be more active in the global health arena. And in fact, last year, um, um, elevated global health as a theme to a vice deanery position. So it's really one of the central pillars of the School of Public Health in the National University here in Singapore. And maybe I'll just end off very quickly by making the comment that the that the prestige of the US has been tremendously tarnished by this pandemic. Um, and I say this with a lot of affection, uh, but uh, my, my, my alma mater, Johns Hopkins, uh, very coincidentally in, in I think, uh, September 2019, produced a Global Health Security Index. And this index uh, placed the United States as the most prepared for a pandemic followed by the United Kingdom. And I think that the events of the last uh, 16 months have amply demonstrated that there are rankings and there are rankings. Uh, back to you, Alet. Thank you very much. Um, would the others like to respond to this question? Dr. Zhou, Dr. Wang, Professor Wang? Okay. Uh, Dr. Ezel, you want to respond first? Uh, yeah, just just uh, 
quickly. Yes, uh, so we are willing to share our lessons and uh, I myself have a lim has a limited capacity, uh, but uh, as a whole, we, we are really open to share our lessons. And one avenue that, uh, that uh, well, uh, well, <laughs> You, you might want to uh, look, uh, well, uh, check the, uh, the, uh, the upcoming uh, uh, in the, uh, IPPR, Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response uh, recommendations, uh, because uh, they are in, uh, conducting this uh, multi-country case studies, and Japan uh, was also included in that case study, and we provided uh, Really, really. Uh, so uh, we we provided uh, almost all the information that we had uh, to that panel. So uh, we we hope uh, that uh, that that the uh, comparative case studies uh, will sort of enlighten us and then also uh, share with us uh, the really uh, um, elaborated uh, and consolidated lessons from uh, individual uh, case studies. But that's one one example, and and also. Uh, uh, just just uh, to, to join in defending the WHO, uh, we, we, we think, uh, I think that WHO should be the, 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 the primary uh, sort of uh, knowledge sharing platform for this kind of uh, uh, lessons. So we do hope, uh, we do uh, looking, look forward to WHO's, uh, again, leading role in consolidating lessons from countries. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Wang. Okay. Uh, well, I agree with uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Azo. Uh, generally speaking, Asian countries are willing to share their information and their experience and even lessons. Actually, in China, we're not only talking about, well, the good experience, we're also talking about what's wrong with the current system. So there has been a massive and uh, uh, legislative effort by National People's Congress to review all these national laws, not only the, well, the, the communicable disease law, but also all the relevant laws together in order to create a systematic, well-designed, system rather than individual pieces. So we, we're actually examining uh, our uh, system, particularly trying to find the loopholes to fix it up. So sharing information does not mean only good experience, but also the lessons as well. And generally speaking, I think uh, Asian countries are willing to do that, uh, but there are some, well, Special situations, I mentioned culture and political system and ideological kind of approach, etc. There are so many different factors we have to take into consideration. I agree completely with Dr. Lin that we should respect the local people and their decision. What we can do is offering some information or experience, whether they would like to take them or not, depends on their decision in their particular situation because we're outsiders. We don't know their fabric of the society. The operation of, um, let's say, uh, inter-agency kind of uh, 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 procedures, etc. And to take an example, after, well, uh, terminating the lockdown in Wuhan, and then the Chinese physicians organized some of the teams were sent to Italy. So they try to introduce what we have done in Wuhan, what we have done in containment of the virus with their own passion. But I would say, they overdo something. They overdid their efforts. Namely, after three days, they talk with the local city, uh, well, council, the governor, whatsoever. 
Oh, three days ago, we agreed that we locked down this street. But look at the street. What do you have been doing? So I think that's already a step over the boundary. That's not your own business. That's the decision by local government, by local people. So namely, we should find out what are the local environments and whether they could accept, they could adopt that even simple measures. And after all, uh, assistance is assistance. They cannot replace the national system and their local government, local people's role. Um, so in seeing that, I think uh, in terms of culture, in China, particularly Confucianism, and there are similar kind of uh, thinking in many other Asian countries, which is look at the individuals in the whole context of community. So I think there are quite a different kind of approach. So uh, we, we certainly respect the individuals and we know the individuals are most important. And, but of course we, we, we understand the individuals in the whole context of the community. And also in China, particularly, we talked about uh, trade-off and which interest comes first. And in China, uh, it's very clear, it's a social consensus that people's health is the primary concern. And economic, political concerns should be, uh, well, after the, well, the health right. So therefore, based on this consideration, is a complete lockdown in Wuhan and you know, kind of semi-lockdown in many other places. So it could be implemented. Uh, I, I don't think this social environment, particularly this kind of social understanding exists everywhere. We have to respect it. Yeah. Professor Wang, I'm sorry, I, we have to move on because uh, we have some questions from yeah. the audience and we only have uh, about 15 more minutes. So I'm sorry, We'll let's try to address them. Um, we had one question uh, by Ong Bauk Chuan. He asked, the infodemic of myths or disinformation cost, ne cost needless lives in the pandemic. How will scholars or practitioner, practitioners harness international law to curb this problem in time for the next uh, pandemic? Uh, how relevant applicable to this is the online diffusion of myths or disinformation? I saw Jeremy Lin. Uh, you started answering this online. Perhaps you want to discuss this. I think this is yeah. uh, an, an important question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alan. Um, Maybe the first thing I'll say is that globally enforceable laws are extremely hard to enact and to implement. Um, it's much like taxes. Uh, when uh, that said, uh, Singapore had this version of uh, uh, falsehoods and misinformation laws that were introduced a few years ago. And I must confess that at that time, I was one of those extremely skeptical that these laws would be used to clamp down on political dissidents and really so on. But uh, now that we are in April of 2021 and you see firsthand the 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 malicious misinformation around vaccines, around particular racial groups and so on. I'm not uh, how should we say? I am I am chastised that there is a need for governments to be strong. There is a need for governments to have effective uh, uh, legislative powers and, and, and enforcement powers to be able to do what is necessary for the greater good. Uh, that said, um, um, the risk of overreach is very, very real. Um, but what is the alternative? And what I what and I responded to to Mr. Ong or Miss Ong um, that the alternatives would be that that um, 
that this would be left to the technology platforms. And I'm per personally not persuaded that Facebook or Twitter would be in better positions to decide what should be allowed and what should not be allowed. Yeah. So it's a very pragmatic way of looking at the least bad option. Back to you, Alet. Yes, I'll just add to that. That uh, and I see, Gianluca, you wanted to go. Go ahead, please. You want to add? Yeah, that. because uh, the and and just this this question would deserve a long discussion because I totally agree with Dr. Lim. I mean, we shouldn't let some huge companies in Silicon Valley uh, make policy choices. And we also have also the, the counterbalance of a uh, freedom of expression as a human rights, but not when it uh, gives this kind of, of, of socially negative consequences. And also can a public agency like WHO, does it have the traction? Does it have the, the reach uh, to counterbalance this? I think it's an open question. WHO has tried to do something about it, but I'm not sure that it's a, uh, can compete with uh, with the power of the social media. Before uh, we, since we are approaching the end, and I really uh, I will have to switch off at five minutes too because I have another talk back to back. But uh, I would like to to uh, to, to to ask you about uh, what Professor Alvarez uh, asked at the beginning. So this uh, growing interest in a new treaty, and uh, <clears throat> some of you mentioned it. Um, what do you think about it? Do we need a new treaty? Do you need a new instrument? And to do what? We have the international health regulations. They have performed well in certain cases. They clearly have design flaws and implementation problems. Um, should the po political capital be devoted to strengthening what we have, to fixing the leaky boat, because it's a leaky boat, or do we need to jump to something new? And, and what, what should the treaty say? Because there's a lot of enthusiasm, but the quite vagueness on what this treaty should do. Rhetorical statements like equitable access to vaccine, what does it mean? How do you get there in a treaty? So I'm, I'm curious to, 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 uh, to see what you think, because inevitably this will be discussed in a month and a half at the health assembly. So it's not just an academic thing, but there will be a lot of policy pressure on that. Uh, Dr. Eze, would you like to go first on this one? Well, I would be more comfortable to learn from you as a le former legal counsel of the WHO who, who dealt with uh, the, this, uh, the first health treaty uh, on tobacco control. But uh, before learning from you and, and other legal experts here, uh, I'm just a public health physician uh, originally. But uh, from my initial short remarks is that we are open to, uh, to discussing the, the, the new treaty, but uh, we... Oops. Um, ...are also interested first. In, uh, we do want to know what uh, the shortcomings uh, and uh, how we, we could uh, fix it. And without that, uh, I think without the you know uh, in-depth analysis of what we have already, uh, it, it would be uh, uh, a bit uh, premature to really devote our limited resources, time and resources, and political capital and energies to uh, to this uh, new treaty. Uh, having said so, we are really really open, and we are really interested in knowing more about the uh, the idea and uh, what sort of. Uh, ingredients uh, that that uh, treaty should entail and we and for that i, I really uh, I, i'm looking forward to learning from those legal experts thanks okay thank you so look at what we have on the shelf try to improve it and start it better before jumping to something new and, and untested dr lim um i think uh, professor but she, despite whatever we say in a month and a half from now, many hours will be spent on discussing the pandemic treaty regardless. But if I can go back to Professor Wang's comment about the village, um, we can we can renovate the village clinic. We can put new medicines in the village clinic. But if the, if the individual villagers continue to vandalize and disrespect the clinic, the clinic will never be particularly helpful. So um, we've spoken a lot about the telescope and the microscope, and perhaps in equal measure, we should apply them. Yeah, good point. Because um, as, as some of you have said, Yaya Cha, 
it's not just the secretariat that doesn't perform as we, as, as we expect, but there's been a low level of compliance. And so I think we need to ask why. Um, is a lack of incentives? Is a lack of deterrence? Uh, so, because you're right, I mean, we can build fantastic treaties, and, but if they don't get the right amount of political traction, they remain a disappointment. Um, Professor Wang, what do you think about this? Well, thank you. I, I agree with the two speakers already on you know, to uh, number one, and we should be open to accept this idea. Number two, we should uh, put the eggs into different, uh, well, baskets rather than just the one basket. So our using a Chinese metaphor, we're working with two legs, which not only put all the weight on the one leg. And uh, while drafting the new treaty, which I'm sure will be a long process involving a lot of um, differences and also debates. Uh, so it will not be an easy thing to be achieved. And at the same time, why don't you use the mechanisms which are available even though they're not that ideal. So we have to well, work uh, with the current system and to cope with the current problem, rather than just uh, well, open a new page and completely wipe out the previous establishment. I, I don't think that's a good approach. And number three, there should be kind of uh, uh, kind of, uh, let's say, consistency between the new and the old. Uh, just simply make it more feasible, uh, trying to avoid the more contentious kind of debates. Thank you. I like the, the, the metaphor of the two legs. That's uh, <laughs> because we risk uh, looking at one leg and weakening the other. And I don't see a particular uh, gain from, from let the existing leg wither on the vine. Um, Ayelet, back to you. And I will have to already excuse myself in four minutes. I will disappear from the screen. And many thanks again. Excellent discussion. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Jen Lucas. I want to follow up on this question on the treaty and link it to what uh, some of you said during uh, your your initial presentations. So essentially, what uh, both uh, Professor Wang and also Dr. Ezo during their presentations, you both talked about better implementation. Especially Professor Wang was talking about you know the the international health regulations are not perfect, but they're good enough. But really, what is missing is implementation. Um, and also Dr. Zhou was saying, you know, how should we improve the WHO? Uh, we should improve imp um, implementation. We should strengthen the WHO. And essentially that is that has been the problem. And really one of the main criticisms that the WHO does not have enough power. It is essentially always subject to what the member states wants, does not have power to essentially get its own information, to go interstate. Every entry is dependent on, on approval by states and so forth. So, Really, the question is, you know, a pandemic treaty would then also likewise, I presume, want to give the WHO more powers. Otherwise, you know, what's what's the point? Is this at all, you know, we can talk about that as much as we want. Is this at all a political feasibility? Do you think that, you know, the countries you're from would agree uh, to a WHO that has more powers, that has independent inspection powers? For instance, one of the issues that have always been raised about implementation is there is not strong enough monitoring mechanisms. Uh, should we take notions like in other treaties, be it on you know, uh, uh, weapons or nuclear energy that they have inspection powers? Is this something that countries will agree to? What do, what do you think? Who, who'd like to begin? Dr. Ezo, you're behind the scenes. You hear the discussions within the governments. What, what is your sense? Is this something that governments would agree to? Um, well, again, uh, so we have to start uh, from the, the issues and, and the problems. And then the, the, the issue is that one of the, the core issues of this uh, 
is that uh, we need to, uh, to to better implement uh, the, uh, the, the what is written in IHR, uh, like uh, how to detect and how to report uh, promptly, and how to uh, declare uh, the, the, that alert uh, uh, appropriately in time. And uh, sorry, if, doctors, I'll just say we have to keep our answers relatively short because we're five minutes okay. to the end. So, so. You, you got my point. So uh, that if if the treaty if the treaty is to uh, is well is to uh, improve those uh, core issue and and that would be uh, that would be an option. Uh, but we really really need to make sure if it uh, uh, solves those uh, core issues. Other, otherwise, it would be another long long uh, debate. Without uh, without too much fruits. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Wang. Okay, very would, shortly. Would yes. this be a political feasibility? We, can you imagine that um, countries would allow for more inspection powers and more intrusion of the WHO into, you know, within states? Well, I, I do not have any ready answer or yes or no answer. And simply because you look at uh, the international community and all the international regimes, so not only public health. So international organizations has the power delegated by the member states in the way of uh, signing the treaties or covenants. And even though for lawyers, we know how to play in this arena, there will be a lot of debates. Even there is a treaty, there will be a lot of, um, let's say, kind of um, uncertain uncertainties in interpreting the treaty, implementing the treaty. Uh, I, I don't think, on one hand, we don't want to have a very firm and consolidated government at home, and then in the international community, we set up uh, more kind of authoritative uh, center organization. I, I don't think that will be something to happen. And uh, well, in every organization, the power comes from the member states and depends on the understanding and particularly consensus of all people in all countries. I, I quote from Dr. Lin's previous, uh, well, statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lim, do you have one minute yeah. response, uh, please? I will take less time than that. Uh, okay. I'm not holding my breath. I think okay. countries will respond much more effectively to carrots than to sticks. And thought I thought experiment if an international donor set aside 20 billion dollars to say countries that are inspected independently and need help there's significant monies to support i suspect many countries will be much more willing to be inspected back to yes. you okay yes good point um doctor so we have one more question from the audience uh perhaps you could give a very quick response R richard hertzfeld is asking that you mentioned that WHO funding mechanisms need to be improved. What would that look like? How could that be done? Million dollar question, but uh, well, <laughs> to try to be brief, uh, well, uh, maybe we should think about how to uh, increase, well, uh, how to uh, I increase the, the, the well, how to decrease the dependence uh, uh, onto the, the the voluntary contributions, uh, but that, that that is a tall order. Uh, increasing the volu well, uh, assessed contribution is not an easy not an easy task, but uh, maybe that that would be the direction. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think we've had a very fruitful discussion. I think it's quite clear um, that what comes out of this discussion that on the one hand, the WHO has a lot of value in the eyes of all of um, the participants here, but quite clearly there are still many areas uh, for improvement. 
Uh, it's not quite clear whether there will be political support for reform. That was something that we'll have to see uh, in the time ahead. And as we have one more minute, I'd like to pass uh, the, the floor to Professor Alvarez to, for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Berman and the panelists, uh, and also uh, Mr. Bertie for um, a fascinating discussion. I'm not sure that we have uh, achieved uh, a common ASEAN position or even a common tripold position on the future global architecture for global health. But I think a lot of things were put forward that are intriguing, certainly from my standpoint. Uh, the idea of seeing the WHO as a clinic serving the villagers uh, and therefore um, not blaming the clinic for all of its flaws certainly resonates with the reality that we have. The reality is quite grim. I just remind you, I just checked the daily death toll uh, around the world, it's approaching 3 million deaths, and that's surely an understatement given the underreporting that we have in a number of places around the world, uh, and 138 million confirmed cases. Uh, regrettably, my own country here, the United States, we're now at uh, approximately 560,000 deaths in one country with 31 uh, million positive cases, uh, even though we are uh, on the fortunate end of the, uh, of the vaccine side of things. And of course, that raises one of the issues that concerns me the most and many people, which is the race and ethnicity of COVID. That is the inequalities north, south, and within countries that reflect the biases, prejudices, structural racism, structural inequalities that are much, much go far deeper than anything the global health regime can possibly fix. And I suspect no treaty, no reform will ever really truly tackle uh, issues that are fundamentally about how we run our own nations uh, and, um, and regrettably, uh, in my view, the fact that, that sovereignty uh, prevents uh, many forms of cooperation that are obviously very much desired. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, Mr. Lin pointed to a very intriguing question of using carrots to get to the sticks. That is, if there was enough money attached to inspection processes or the prospects that you would get other benefits of status or other benefits in the global system. I do think we certainly have recipes for far more intrusive inspection systems when it comes to nuclear weapons, as, as Professor Berman illustrated. And we have, for example, if there were willingness at the Security Council, a ready tool to actually force states to do things uh, and sometimes in exchange for other things. Uh, look at the uh, demise but perhaps re-rise of the Iran deal as just one example. When we're serious about something, uh, and I think global health is certainly as serious as uh, nuclear weapons or terrorist uh, attacks. And in fact, the IHRs, as all of you know, have been modified so that they are not dealing just with natural pandemics, but for any kind of risk to global health that could be posed by man-made uh, disasters. So we've now crossed the threshold of thinking of glo about global health, not just as a health issue, but as a fundamental security issue for both communities and individuals. And there are tools for that, but it is a matter of whether the political will and perhaps the money uh, and the skills uh, can emerge. I'm hopeful that uh, the Asian countries uh, represented on this panel will be at the forefront, not just in rendering their own individual assistance to other countries that come to them, but putting their own heads together so that there is perhaps some common solutions in the reform agenda uh, that, uh, that your countries can advance. And I hope this is a modest step in uh, trying to do this. There's a much bigger conversation, but thank you all for uh, participating in it. And with that, I think uh, we're at the end of our uh, uh, two hours. And so uh, I leave you and thank you, uh, Professor Berman, also, and thank uh, the leadership of the Center for International Law at Singapore for helping to put this together. Thank you all.
Thank you, everyone. Thank bye you bye. very Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.